So it's time for our next talk, right? Uh, and we have with us here Armand Bogen, who is our uh, brand new cloud regulatory and compliance advisor. Uh, and we're also going to tie that together with a, a couple of words from Johan Christensen, our VP of Innovation. So we're going to get both the sort of Swedish perspective of uh, compliance and digital sovereignty, as well as the European perspective of things. And we'll see how, how these two have planned to tie this together. So, uh, yeah, take it away, Alma. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm... Uh, thank you. Arman Borghem, like Oscar said, uh, I, this is my third week at Klura, uh, so, and uh, they're already calling for the police to get me. <laughs> um, yes, and uh, my background is uh, from the public sector. Uh, before that, I got a law degree, but I'm uh, my niche has sort of been the um, the convergence between law and IT. So the GDPR has been a big deal in the public sector. We have, uh, you know, uh, public access to information and secrecy laws, which I'm going to touch upon a bit in this presentation. Uh, and uh, yeah, the question of digital sovereignty is uh, is for sure growing in the sort of public sector in that space as well. So I'm going to talk about a bit about, um, well, where uh, where do we stand in the public sector uh, when it comes to the cloud? Uh, are, are they staying put or are they uh, finding a way up there? And uh, where's the government uh, heading? So there has been um, a debate, uh, there was a debate, I, I should say, in the public sector regarding um, information covered by secrecy laws. So, and when, when I say that, a lot of people think, oh, it's like national security, it's like, you know, state secrets, it's, uh, you know, military secrets. But, um, Actually, there's a lot more covered by uh, Swedish secrecy laws. Uh, OSL in Swedish, you've perhaps heard about it. Offentlighets och sekretesslagen. It can be anything from, uh, you know, sensitive information in uh, a municipal um, care um, system to, you know, when you get a bid in a procurement process. Uh, so it could be business secrets um, and, and many other things. And uh, the... The debate uh, for a long time was whether it was at all possible to put this kind of information with an external provider. And uh, some people said, yes, it's fine, you can just go ahead. Um, even in the American clouds, it's fine, no problem. Uh, or at least, you know, you, you, you do like an information classification and then you can do it. Um, whereas others have had more of a cautious approach uh, and, and pointed to the legisl legislation perhaps not being quite up to date. And the government has, uh, you know, proposed legislation, and I'm going to talk a bit about how uh, that journey from uh, an original proposal to the final uh, proposal, because there will be a change in, probably, in, in the Swedish law uh, by um, July 1st this year, uh, which I'm going to uh, touch upon a bit. So, uh, in Sweden, every government agency, municipality, they basically make their own decisions when it comes to IT and what they want to purchase. The government can't tell, uh, you know, a government agency or a municipality, you should buy this or you should do, you should apply the law exactly in this way in this specific case. Uh, so there's a lot of independence. Uh, what they can do is they can um, instruct in general terms uh, what a government agency does, should do. And of course, they can propose uh, legislation. Um, and so this has created a bit of a, a, a vacuum, which has been filled by one a voluntary cooperative organization in Sweden between government agencies. So there are 36 government agencies that are cooperating in what's called ESAM, or the, if I should translate it, e-cooperation program. So basically, these government agencies have different working groups, they have uh, teams and, and projects, and they collaborate on issues concerning digitalization, uh, which can cover anything from, you know, uh, how to create value uh, with IT to um, legal questions and technical questions, architecture, and so on and so on. Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the, uh, the last few years, what has, what has happened. So this... Um, uh, collaboration organization, ESAM, they issued a statement where they um, 
touched upon the conflict between this secrecy law, which I mentioned, OSL, and the Cloud Act, uh, which was relatively new at that time, which caused quite a stir. And then uh, another government agency, oh, well, SM is not a government agency, but a government agency called Kammar Kollegiet um, uh, made a report uh, on um, web-based collaboration suites, uh, which, because they wanted to see if they could procure a framework agreement where uh, public sector organizations were, would be able to buy web-based uh, office suites. And they found that, no, uh, at that time, there were no legal and um, technical and feature-wise appropriate alternatives. And they also point, and one reason was American legislation like FISA 702, which is an extraterritorially applied um, legislation, uh, which allows the American intelligence services to gather uh, information from a cloud service provider, uh, if, if it's an American one. <clears throat> and um, that caused quite a stir as well. I was, uh, uh, I, I, I wrote uh, bits of that uh, report uh, when I worked at Kammer Kollegiet. Then we have the famous uh, Schrems II judgment from the European uh, Court of Justice. And uh, then people started to realize, mm, maybe there's something to this, what these people are saying. Um, and the government uh, started to act here. So they, um, they, they uh, uh, put together um, an inquiry which looked into uh, whether the law should change in some way and how to, uh, like, if there were any, uh, anything needlessly uh, frustrating uh, the ability of the public sector to use cloud services and other types of external IT services. Um, then, uh, in 2021, the tax agency and the enforcement agency, Kronofogdemyndigheten in Swedish, uh, they published a memo uh, where they looked at whether they could uh, switch out Skype, because, believe it or not, the Swedish tax agency, which was my previous employer, they still use Skype for business uh, on-prem, which is uh, legal, but not very modern. And uh, of course, there's an interest in moving to something more modern. And they looked at whether they could move to Teams, concluded that they could not. For several reasons, uh, the American surveillance legislation being one of them. And then we've, we've uh, you know, gradually, of course, this has happened gradually over the course of several years. But I would say last year, uh, things really started to move on the market. And it's, it's been accelerating. And then you have the. Um, the full-scale invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia, uh, which also has added to the imperative of thinking about data in a much more serious way and how to maintain control and, uh, and sovereignty and self-determination over uh, our data and how we use our uh, IT services. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and, then, and now there is a proposal to amend uh, the secrecy law, OSL. Uh, which uh, introduces an inappropriateness test, which I will get to in a bit. And basically, what is this all about? It's uh, about under which circumstances can we use an external IT provider? Uh, when is it legal? When is it, is it appropriate? These are two different questions. And how to maintain sovereignty. And actually, what this new legislative change um, does is it, <laughs> you could say, in some situations, it makes it illegal to be inappropriate. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, not being appropriate uh, will become illegal, uh, which is uh, ah, interesting. So, but first I will talk about the original proposal to change OSL. And that was that the idea was you could weigh the need to keep information secure, the need to keep in secret information secure against the economic or practical benefits from using an, an external IT provider. So when you put your secret information with the external IT provider, if they can access that information, uh, it, that would be OK, even though it's covered by secrecy laws. If you can sort of uh, argue that uh, you get a sufficient uh, practical or economic benefit from being able to use this external provider. And uh, some government agencies did not think this was uh, the best uh, way to, to do this. Uh, and they argued rather that 
if you have information that needs to be keep, kept safe and secure and secret, then you need to fulfill that bar. You need to look at, okay, what is the information? How, how secure does it need to be? And you need to fulfill that bar, uh, regardless of any economic or practical benefit you might get from uh, outsourcing or using an external IT provider. Um, so this is basically an abbreviated and simplified version of the new proposal, which uh, did not, uh, they did not proceed with the original proposal, but rather they say secrecy does not prevent placing information with an external service provider for only technical processing or storage, if considering the circumstances, this isn't inappropriate. Okay, <laughs> not, the, not the simplest uh, <laughs> phrasing <laughs> of a law, um, but basically you need to consider if what you're doing is inappropriate. Okay, what does that mean? What do, what do you put into that word, right? And what the, what the government suggests is, okay, you need to look at everything, or rather, a, at least a very wide variety of aspects and circumstances concerning what you want to do, concerning your outsourcing, regarding the information you want to uh, give out to the service provider, regarding who the service provider is, what the nature of the service that you're going to use, and so on. So if, question. Uh, well, so this is for only technical processing or storage. That's when you can apply this, um, this uh, sort of exemption, which basically means even if the information is covered by secrecy laws, you can give it out, uh, but only for technical, it, well, only if the sort of service you're buying or, or using from the external provider is only technical processing or storage. Now, uh, the government says that if, if human uh, intervention is needed, so maybe in some cases, um, you know, support technician or, or someone else, an administrator, needs to actually look at this data. But that could be okay. But only if it's, um, if the purpose of that action is still to technically process or store the data. So, so basically what you're saying is that application is this excuse. Depends on the level of involvement from if if the purpose of uh, I'm application maintenance in other sense, at least it's application. Well, what do you put into maintenance? What is included in maintenance? No, I would say that could be that could be covered. Um, if but because I think the distinction they want to make here is if. Uh, if you're hiring, hiring an external provider to actually have people look at the data and analyze it, a human being analyzing the data, actually dealing with the data. Do you hear a sense where they make the amendment saying basically if you have an application maintenance outside of Europe looking at the data, or if doing application maintenance on a system that can use the data, yeah. they need to be within the European Union? Yes, but that's, now we're in the GDPR. Yeah, but, but yes. I'm just saying, what is application maintenance? Yes, but... Uh, is that excluded? Uh, it's, it's not explicitly excluded or included, but... So I, I, can, only, I can only speak from, from their, word, their words of the law. Uh, <laughs> um, but if... if <laughs> um, if the purpose of the of the service you're buying is that you want an application which will only technically process and store your data, and that's what well, that's what the what, what's actually happening, except in some situations where maybe someone needs to look at some data because they want to they need to you know provision something or they need to um, you know upgrade something or or uh, whatever, that's uh, that's covered. I would say according to the that's the government's intention. I would say. But you can read the, the government's proposal uh, by yourself. Uh, this is a simplified version, so I won't. I won't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's let's go on. Um, 
So some factors that they say you should consider in an inappropriateness test or appropriateness test is, interestingly enough, is this thing you want to do legal? Is the service you're buying legal? That's, uh, that's what they start out with. So, I mean, that's kind of a uh, non-starter. Obviously, what you do needs to be legal, you would think. But they mention this anyway. Um, then they, they cover, OK, but this data processing, this data handling, is it, uh, is it predictable? Can you, can you have some measure of predictability to what's going to happen uh, if you use this service provider? And of course, security is, is important. Uh, they even mention what does the provider's business model look like? That's something you should think about. Um, they, they look at, okay, what, what are the contract terms? What the con what's the contractual relationship between you and the service provider? Um, and in particular, are there any contract terms which risk uh, taking away your control over this data? And here we can see, uh, from my experience, clear uh, differences between some service providers' uh, terms and other service providers' terms. No, no one mentioned, uh, but you can figure out what I mean. Um, is there a legal uh, confidentiality applying to this service provider? Can it be enforced? Uh, or is, is there a contractual uh, confidentiality? I mean, as we know, some extraterritorial legislation will override what you stipulate in a contract. So that's something you obviously should think about. Uh, is my reflection when I when I look at this um, and they actually mention the geographical location of the data uh, that's something you should uh, factor in as well and whether any subcontractors might have access to the data and again here we can see some service providers have these huge lists of, of subcontractors I would say it's virtually impossible for a customer to keep track of all of them assess all of them um, and uh, from all these locations uh, where they might access data. Um, because this is, <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the hyper, some hyperscalers uh, terms, it's, uh, it's not just the US which is a problem. You're actually uh, agreeing to the possibility of data being processed from numerous locations all around the globe, uh, which not many people always uh, think about. So uh, in conclusion, uh, so the government have, has had an ambition to make it easier for the public sector to digitalize, to use the, all the possibilities of digitalization. Uh, we, we were even going to be the world's best at it, uh, according to one uh, goal. Uh, and uh, I would say here they have taken a step in that direction to make it, uh, to make an, uh, make it easier or an enablement. But it's, uh, they've also put up high guardrails. And uh, in this inappropriateness <coughs> test, uh, you need to think about a lot of factors. I've, I didn't even mention all of them now. I mentioned six, of, six points, I think. But if you look at the whole um, uh, proposal for the, for the legal amendment, uh, it's uh, a few pages, like not, not super, not a not ton of text. Uh, they go into this in a bit more detail and cover some more uh, things you should think about as well. And, uh, but as I mentioned, What's emphasized is, I would say, uh, predictability, being able to foresee what could happen with the data, maintaining control of the data. Uh, and um, to think about here, when you, when you contract out, I would say, yeah, think about, is there a huge list, a huge and long list of subcontractors which might access the data from a ton of different locations? If so, and, and can new subcontractors be um, hired uh, without you really having the ability to assess them in time to be able to leave the service if you need to. Um, and uh, you should even consider the provider's business model. Um, I would say these amendments, even though they don't explicitly mention that this is digital sovereignty legislation or anything like that, I would say they're still in line with improving uh, digital uh, sovereignty or digital self-determination, if you will. Uh, I hope this was uh, helpful, interesting, to uh, hear uh, some things about uh, how things are going in the public sector. Thank you. Can you very briefly 
of running a plugin. This is, um, from my perspective, is this a requirement that sharpens GDPR? Um, and whether this is something that other companies may start to aspire as a better practice than GDPR? Or should we still aim for the GDPR coming in the moment as well? I would say, so GDPR is about individuals' rights, right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't really, I don't know if, if I would say that it's uh, digital sovereignty legislation, really. This is perhaps more in that vein. Um, this covers any information covered by secrecy laws. That could be personal data, it could be non-personal data, actually. Um, so this, uh, but then you also have, on the EU level, legislation like the NIS2 directive and you have other legislation in the pipeline which I would say are definitely more towards the digital sovereignty uh, direction. Uh, this is a Swedish government's proposal to change a Swedish law uh, and I mean obviously if you if you have a ton of EU legislation coming in maybe you want to hold off to make up your own laws in that area as well right you want to uh, be harmonized with the EU and whatever comes from there. I don't know if that was the, an answer to your question. Yeah, because there's been a lot of talk about um, I don't know if they call it equivalency coming. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This summer, and I think that this. That's uh, that. Maybe that will be a different talk because uh, I have lots of stuff to say on that uh, subject as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to jump in here for a little bit. Yeah. And. Uh, According to the schedule, I was supposed to hold a presentation, but I'm going to do you guys a huge favor. I had prepared 200 slides, and I'm not going to do them, just to save you guys. Instead, I figure we'll have a little bit of a chat. Yeah. And you reminded me of the whole lawyer type of thing there, where you said, <clears throat> you said um, it's not explicitly included. <laughs> But I want you to know that it's also not explicitly excluded. And right there, you're just like, that's why we're screwed. <laughs> because the lawyers are saying these words, and it's impossible, right? And that kind of leads me to the first question. But I'll say this. I think I know most of everybody here. And I'll, I'll try to learn from Oscar's thing here and say, my name is Johan. I'm, I'm the founder of Clula. And I'll leave it at that from that perspective and get into some of the questions. But so. You know, I listened to that, and I got a chance to read your presentation before, right? But, you know, I think we all have a problem with the vagueness of laws in general, right? And everybody's like, oh, is it really legal? Is it not legal? Blah, blah, blah. And here we're talking about an inappropriate test. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, wow, that really clarified things. So. So are you, you being sarcastic? I am there? being slightly yeah, sarcastic, yeah, you know, yeah. because as you went through that, that could be inappropriate or maybe not. It depends if it's included explicitly or not. So just elaborate on the fact that like from a government perspective or the public sector in general, yeah. we're struggling with this, right? Yeah. You know, in a big way. Why is it so hard to kind of narrow that down to say this is it and this is not? To me, this I get the inappropriate aspect, but to me, this is challenging it almost yeah. even more. I mean, uh, IT is getting more and more complex. The legislation is also getting more and more complex. And finally, how these two interact with each other is getting more and more complex. Yes, it's difficult. Yeah. And, and, you, and I mean, some people say, oh, it's just, uh, you know, legislation, it's... Uh, without sort of thinking about, well, what are the values that this legislation is supposed to protect? And here it's uh, maintaining control over data, which can be quite sensitive to businesses, to individuals. And, uh, and you need people who both understand law and technology to be able to work out what, should, what is an inappropriate and what is not. Now, this, is, this, is, uh, this legislation hasn't even had a, a come into effect yet, so we'll see how different uh, agencies apply it and different interpretations of it. But yeah, it, I, I can just agree. Yes, it's I was the, hoping for more clarity. And it, to <laughs> me, I don't know if you guys, if you feel super clear, right? Like as in what's appropriate and what's not. And who decides that anyway? And then you have interpretation for each one, right? So 
But interesting, because at least that part, of course, I think could be a good thing, because you're not allowed to do certain secrecy yeah. outside, yeah. but you need to look at it to say, hey, listen, yeah. does it make sense? I guess, is that what we're saying? All right, so the, the, the European uh, Commission came out with a little report saying that by 2030, why the European Commission does want to do this, I don't know, but by 2030, there's a goal that 75% of workloads, European workloads, should be in cloud. But somebody wrote an article about this report saying that the, the, the headline was this, you know, um, can the EU afford to drive out American cloud services? So coming from the public sector, knowing that you guys have been more restrictive, can the EU afford to drive out American cloud services? Uh, I don't know if that's an end goal in and of itself, uh, but... Uh what we want is, I think it's clear from the EU, uh, digital uh, solutions which respect U European values, which we believe are fundamental values. So we need to, I mean, if we, if we want to fulfill that, we may have to invest in our own businesses. If, if the other you know, if the, if the other offers on the market don't fulfill that, then uh, then maybe that's what will put pressure on them. Yeah. Yeah? Like either either we will have to supply it for by ourselves, or if they see uh, this market growing, they will have to adapt and uh, sublicense their technology or you know find other ways to uh, to do it. Can we afford to? I mean, if we. Uh, if we just give up, haven't we given up part of what's, what makes us uh, Europeans uh, and what makes us believe in our own fundamental rights? Uh, that doesn't seem very, uh, like a very nice thought to me anyway. So I think we, we need to try. I like that. I, uh, I, I agree with you. I think we have to try, right? But you know, I think it's a it's a dual thing, right? But okay, so the other thought I have is like when I read your presentation, I'm thinking like this, you know. So this is all about the government. You know, we get a lot of private companies here, including our suppliers as well, right? So all of a sudden you have ASM, 36 government agencies saying, like, ah, GDPR doesn't work there. Never mind OSL or any of these other types of laws, right? But what about the private sector? So you just came from the public sector. Yeah. How do you guys view the private sector? Because it, to me, it seems like, okay, you guys are doing this thing over there. Mm. And that's the state. Yeah. But over here, we're playing with all the fun stuff. <laughs> it's like yeah, that yeah. movie, you know, you're, on the, you're in the cesspool area, you know. It's like, what, 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 like well, if, what, if, what, what's the deal with the private sector? Like, if, you if, guys are driving a public sector thing, yeah. but what, what's happening there? I mean, if we look at, the, so if you move away from OSL for a moment into the GDPR, uh, I mean, the GDPR applies to both the public and private sector, right? So when the public sector uh, moves to uh, enable and, and to, um, you know, uh, ask for com GDPR compliant uh, IT solutions, of course, the, the private sector can benefit from that as well. And I'm sure the, the public sector would be ecstatic to see, uh, you know, private sector initiatives too. And like the more, de the more demand in aggregate there is for compliant solutions, the more it benefits everybody. It doesn't matter if it's a company buying them or if it's the pub a public sector organization buying them. That will spur demand. That will uh, increase investment. That will show investors that here's a market to, to invest in. And uh, that will improve things for everybody. So right now, the, the public sector has been uh, a big driver. And maybe also because, you know, the public sector probably sees itself as having a, an especially high responsibility to actually follow the laws, which, you know, have been democratically elected and so on. Um, businesses make sometimes sense. make business risks, uh, calculated risks, uh, in a bit of a different way. But again, uh, referring to, you know, as we see, there's a bunch of EU legislation coming in. And, and w when do you legislate? It's when individual actors perhaps don't have quite enough of an incentive on their own to do the right thing. Or, you know, a, a company could be, could be sitting there thinking, hmm, I would, I would like to do 
uh, the right thing, but maybe there's not enough enforcement uh, on my competitors. So if I do the right thing, but, all my, but my competitors don't, then I would be at a disadvantage. And so maybe that's the reason that they uh, don't choose to do the compliant thing. Uh, but that's, wh that's when legislation comes in. So okay, so now you have to do the right thing, right? And that will uh, also be a driver, because I think there will be, besides more le legislation, there will be more enforcement. I mean, the, the level of enforcement has been going from, if we, if we say, think about the GDPR, very low, till growing, 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 and it will keep growing. Uh, the Swedish um, supervisor authority for uh, enforcing the GDPR has uh, recently gotten a substantial increase in its uh, funding. And I think uh, this is uh, a trend we will see where there will be more and more enforcement cases, which in turn will lead to, you know, some of these will be, um, uh, will, will not be accepted by those who are enforced against. They will go to court, and then the courts will make decisions. Some of those decisions, maybe they will ask questions to the European Court of Justice. We will get more and more case law, which will bring more and more clarity, <laughs> which uh, you asked for before. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that too. Not actual <laughs> no, it will. If you get more clarity, then uh, then it will be more difficult for companies and other organizations to to hide behind, you know, saying there's uh, there's no, uh, you know, we don't we didn't know what to do or it wasn't clear or uh, plus there will be an actual risk of enforcement. But I think it will also bring more public attention to this. People will actually care more because. They see that if they do care more, there's actually uh, there's a real chance of changing things uh, because companies could be enforced against. So you say they have to do the right thing. I just <laughs> like to remind everybody: we still have people robbing banks, so you never know, right? But okay. So, so one question that I actually didn't understand. Maybe you guys didn't understand either. So ASA, we got that explanation, right? The 36 government agencies working together. And then at one point I saw Deisum, and I was like, Deisum, shit, that must have been a misspelling, right? But it wasn't. Oh. No, no, it wasn't, right? That's a, a project within ESA. Right. So it's, uh, it's been a group which uh, focused on the, a specific type of IT solution, namely uh, collaboration solutions. So basically, you know, uh, chat, uh, group chats, you know, with persistent channels, uh, video conferencing, um, document sharing, uh, that sort of thing. And now I hear rumors that there's an H, Sam? Right, that's, that's right. Um, okay. And even I believe uh, a, a group looking, so H, Sam, looks at HR solutions. Uh, and uh, so they're trying to basically do something similar, like DSM did, but for HR solutions. HR solutions. And uh, I believe uh, some people are looking at community. Uh, the type of solution a communications department would uh, would use as well. So do you see that continuously? ASM will kind of go through the field of applications and continue in that? It certainly looks as, that way. As trying to recommend? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, why stop? I mean, uh, it's uh, there's a need not just in within one type of solution space. There's a, there's a huge need. And a lot of that work is really about engaging the market, engaging the vendors on the market to make them understand the public sector's needs in that case. Some of which are pretty much identical to the private sector's needs, by the way, if we look at the GDPR uh, question in particular. All right. So, okay, so, you know, I was going to say a few words about trends, like, and there's a bunch of trends out there, but I think you touch on the biggest trends, right? We all know automation is the key aspect, right? It's been going on for 15 years. I think we can all feel like, oh, shit, we need to automate a little bit more. Not everything is perfect in our backyard, so to speak, right? So that's always something that's going to continue. I think it's going to continue for the next 10 years, right? However, you touch on the regulatory side. I think that complexity will continue to grow, right? You have, you have new laws coming out at, at a pace that is like mind-boggling, right? And, and maybe laws that's not affecting us, like DSA, DMA, and, and yeah. you know, we have ENISA coming yeah. out with NIS2, and that, of course, affects us, right? Now you have other ones coming out, you have AI and so forth. It's becoming a huge, com hugely complex world to live in, never mind translating that into infrastructure. How does that really play out, right? 
So that trend will continue in a big way, right? Yeah. And then I think you touched on the biggest one, which is that digital sovereignty, which I think I personally believe, you talk about the public sector, right? I think it's going to affect us all in a big way. We're seeing some of these kind of horrific things, right? I mean, from a war, but also the things that kind of made us realize how sensitive we are, right? Whether it's a chip manufacturing aspect, right? What happens if Taiwan gets in trouble? What does that really mean to us, right? And all of that stuff. And then you start thinking like, well, what if somebody started pulling resources that we thought we had for real, right? So that digital sovereignty. And Andrea, of course, you touch on a lot of cool things in the sense of saying, if you don't have digital sovereignty, do you actually have national sovereignty, right? And in today's world, yeah, you don't, do you? Because so much of what we do today underpins everyday life with something digital, regardless of what we do, right? So that digital sovereignty aspect, I think it's going to be the biggest trend for the next 10 years, as in, you know, for me, maybe it means slightly different to different people. For me, it means the robustness of the society, right? But I also believe that capacity and capability within Europe is absolutely key for us to continue to live the way we've lived in the past. You know, like our next generation, we've been very competitive in Europe. We've had awesome lives, you know. Some of you guys have houses in Spain and this and that, and we're living life. But will that continue if we cannot be competitive going forward? So I think the digital sovereignty, you can take your approach. That's a little scary, right? A little doom and gloom and, you know, you know, shit, less Spain, more doom and gloom. And, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a matter of can we compete in the future because everything is digital. And do we have to borrow, you know, who in Europe will pay $10 billion like that because now somebody has something AI that actually seems like AI, right? Who in Europe will do that? SAP? I don't think so. Even though that's the one company we have in Europe that actually has something to say about anything. So it's a little bit of that. And I think to your point, you mentioned here, like, the one way that that'll actually play out is investment into things that we do here. And that goes for a lot of broad things, right? But we're horribly behind. You know, we represent something that we're proud of and, and we're quite advanced. But of course, also compared to some of, some of the things that are out there, you know, we're not. And that goes for, you know, Google's AI tool, or if you guys saw the launch of Alibaba's tool, I don't know, 10%, 12% the stock went down because they couldn't show it live. It's that much of an effect today, you know, in a big way. So I think those are the two, three trends that yeah. are big. Aman, we're super happy to have you on board. Glad to be and here. And a very, very nice presentation. And uh, with that, you also uh, skipped my 200 slides uh, in one shot. Thanks so much, Aman.